Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sin. Greetings and welcome everybody to another edition of the Divine Program of the World's History on this beautiful May 4th. All right, sorry, 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 May 5th, 2019. Yes, yesterday was the 4th, today is the 5th. It is a Sunday, and I have both Michael and Yerk Listman with me today, and we are well into the book um, dealing with Ignatius Loyola here. And, of course, there's a bunch of very interesting topics coming up very soon. Michael, Welcome. Hi, Brad. Thanks for inviting me. And um, also, er again, as every time, I'm very much looking forward to read this book and to have uh, some clues. And hopefully I got some valuable end remarks of it. <laughs> so without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to our brother Jörg in Belgium. Okay. Hello, you two guys. Wonderful to be with you again. Wonderful to have the next reading, which is about the 28th, so somewhere between 25 and 30 reading of this book. Um, <laughs> Brett and I yesterday had a small discussion mm. about the right number. We said if we don't come out, we just say, well, this is the next reading, and you just check the playlist and you will see how many there are. Mm. Um, we started yesterday going a little bit deeper into the history of uh, introducing to all of you Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order. 
And I mentioned yesterday that there is another book next to this one, what we are reading now, where the history of Ignatius of Loyola is very, very detailed um, uh, descriptive. It is wonderful. It is a wonderful read. It is from a German author who lived a few years in the United States of America and who wrote his book on the Jesuits in 1866. And it was shortly after that time translated into English. I am talking about this book, The Jesuits, A Complete History of Their Open and Secret Proceedings from the Foundation of the Order to the Present Time, speaking of the time of 1866, by Karl Theodor Griesinger. Yes, I see there is a date, 1887 here. This is maybe when this book was put in the library or whatever. Here you have a link that we can provide for you on archive.org in the description box of the video so that you can download it there. I probably will upload it to my own archive.org also one of these days if I ever get to all that uploading <laughs> I want to do there. Um, so it says here the book is from 1885, but that's the translation work because the German work was uh, oh. was written in 1866 and uh, volume 2 also and uh, volume 2 then appeared in 1872. I have an original print of that book in my closet standing right here. As you see, it is 850 pages. That is all of the uh, that is all two volumes and here you can see that in 1872 he already gave a preface to the second edition so this 1887 is another date this is more the date regular for what the book is all about and in this book you get a very very detailed um, history of the life and the development of Ignatius of Loyola even more detailed than what we have been reading on the Divine Program of the World's History up to now, because we are going to continue today in that, but I just wanted to show you that you can also have a look at this book, and this, by the way, is the German book as it looks like um, when you buy it. I don't have a picture of the English one, but you can get that on the internet if you're interested in that. And uh, Just if you really want to know where the Jesuits origin from, where Ignatius Loyola originates from, I can very much advise you that book. It's, as I said, 850 pages in English, and there is not one page wasted, meaning every page is worth uh, reading, I can assure you. And Michael can confirm what I say, because Michael read most of part one and part two, volume one and volume two in German with me. Ain't that true, Michael? Yeah, that's correct. That just what just <laughs> you put the thoughts out of my head. It's just that I was <laughs> going to back up, uh, so that it's just a very valuable book and very much underestimated book. As the same same goes for the book which we are which we are reading today, of course. But the Tiago Griesinger book is also a valuable source for other writers. For example, I thought it was Tapa Saucy, wasn't it? Uh, no, it was um, Eric John Phelps. Oh, Eric John Phelps, yeah. yeah. Eric yeah. John Phelps but used the book from Karl Theodor Griesinger as one of the reference books that he studied before he wrote his Vatican Assassin's Wounded in the House of My Friends, yeah. Okay, I mixed I mix it up, sorry, but but no again, problem. it's just, just a valuable book and I, I just haven't uh, met it, just uh, recognized it in English the Theodor Griesinger book, but of course it's a very much in-depth analysis of the Jesuit behavior throughout the centuries. And that's why it is also available in two separate books, but it's just worth worthwhile reading. And I think it's just, if you're, if you're into inter-history, you will find some interesting facts you will not get from the usual books, isn't it? That's absolutely correct, yeah. So, Brad, do you have uh, anything to say to this, or shall I just continue now with the reading oh, of the book? All I can say is you piqued my interest again in this book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, it would be, I know it, it's a real good one, and you've been stressing that with me from day one. You should really read this, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> would be interesting, okay. of course, to take the time and read this online in English also, as I did in German. I did in German about... Ooh, time-consuming. Uh, yeah, I, I, I did you're, about... You're already stressed out. Don't put more on your plate <laughs> than you need to. That's all my. I got to say. You know. I, I did about 75 readings for both volumes in German, so um, that's, that's quite a lot. 
Um, yeah, but I'm glad I did it. And I'm glad I shared this now in this video when we are reading the Divine Program of the World's History from Albert Close. As Michael correctly said, this is also a very underestimated and very little known book. Um, therefore, this is why we promote those things. And um, I'm looking forward to continue our reading in that book of the Divine Program of the World's History. And we are going to read on page 71 in the PDF or page 54 in the book. The <coughs> second portion of the book, actually, because the second, there's yeah. 70 pages in the beginning that deal with the, uh, what do you call it, the temporal history. And then we go into the European ecclesiastical history, which we're in now. Yeah. Big but, difference. But as you see, of course, uh, in the PDF, it is still a little bit more than 100 pages that we have left before we come to the closure of this book. So we still have a few sessions in front of us, and therefore, without any further ado, let us continue. I already re read this little paragraph that I'm going to repeat right now. I also read this little footnote, which goes on this page and this page. I read that already, so I'm just going to repeat this little um Paragraph That's right, here, Dirk. Thank and then we you. go, and then we go to the next uh, paragraph, to the next page over. Uh, the footnote is in the last reading already included. So in Manresa, I don't know why they write it here with double S. It's always written in one S, Manresa. It's Manresa, mm. Manresa. He occupied a cell. He, speaking of Ignatius of Loyola, of course, he occupied a cell in the Dominican convent, and as he was then projecting a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. <laughs> You're going to read about that pilgrimage in Griesinger's book, very, very detailed. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just going to spoil the experience for you. The Roman protector of Jerusalem, the nuncio from the Pope at that time, if you want to call it that way, he just kicked Ignatius Loyola in the behind out of Jerusalem. And why? Well, read Griesinger's book and you'll understand this. <laughs> <laughs> that was really a part I remember, Michael, we were laughing about when we read that, right? Yes, and I'd like to mention on top of it that Griesinger doesn't, doesn't only uh, tell history, but he tells the reason and the methods the Jesuits are using. And I, I think for me it was just the most valuable part of the book, mm -hmm. that he was, that he was uh, si stating how and which methods uh, the Jesuit used to achieve their goals, and that's not, not, not part of any book, you see. That's correct. And he wrote it in a kind of a novel style, you know? Yeah. It yeah. is so fluently easy to read. It is just when you start with one page, you, want to, you, don't, want the day, uh, you don't want the day to end because you really want to continue reading. It is such a wonderful read, Re really. That's um, a little advice from Michael and me for you to Dug, dig into it if you have the possibility to do so. Well, possibility. If you can get it for free on online on, uh, as a PDF, so it only costs you the time to surf to the website, click download, and then start reading, of course. Anyway, in Manresa, he occupied a cell in the Dominican convent, and as he was going, uh, as he was then projecting a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, he began to qualify himself for this holy journey by a course of the severest penances. He scorched himself thrice a day. He rose up to prayer at midnight and passed seven hours of each day on his knees. It will hardly do to say that this marvelous case is merely an instance of an unstrung bodily condition and of vicious mental stimulants abundantly supplied where the thirst for adventure and distinction was still unquenched. A closer study of the case will show that there was in it an awakening of the conscience. There was a sense of sin, its awful demerit and its fearful reward. Loyola, too, would seem to have felt the terrors of death and the pains of hell. He had spent three days in Montserrat in confessing the sins of all his past life. But on a more searching review of his life, finding that he had omitted many sins, he renewed and amplified his confessions at Manresa. It was intimated to him one day that he should yet see the Saviour in person. He had not long to wait for the promised revelation, though. At Mass his eyes were opened, and he saw the incarnate God in the host. 
in the Eucharist, in the transubstantiated piece of bread. What father proved did he need of transubstantiation, seeing the whole process had been shown to him? Ha! A short while thereafter, the Virgin revealed herself with equal plainness to his bodily eyes. Can you believe it? Not fewer than thirty such visits did Loyola receive. Ha! What a blessed man, the Roman Catholic would say. I say, what a damn fool! One day, as he sat on the steps of the church of St. Dominic at Manresa, singing a hymn to Mary, he suddenly fell into a reverie and had a symbol of the ineffable mystery of the Trinity shown to him, under the figure of three keys of a musical instrument. He sobbed for very joy and, entering the church, began publishing the miracle. On another occasion, as he walked along the banks of the Lobregat, the river that waters Manresa, I just wanted to say that's the river. <laughs> See, we all <laughs> does say that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't prepare the reading, so. He sat down and, fixing his eyes intently on the stream, many divine mysteries became apparent to him, such as. Uh, such as other men, says his biographer Maffei, can with great difficulty understand after much reading, long virgils and study. So let me just put this picture of the book here and then we continue. This narration places us beside the, res uh, the respective springs of Protestantism and Romanism. The source from which the one is seen to issue is the word of God. To it, Luther swore fealty, and before it he uh, and before it he hung up his sword like a true knight when he received ordination. The other is seen to be the product of a concluded yet proud and ambitious imagination and a wayward will, and therewith have corresponded the fruits as the past three centuries bear witness. The one principle has gathered round it a noble host, uh, a noble host clad in the panoply of purity and truth. In the wake of the other has come the dark army of the Jesuits. Among the wonderful things shown to Ignatius Loyola by special revelation was a vision of two great camps. The center of the one was placed at Babylon and over it there floated the gloomy ensigns of the Prince of Darkness. The heavenly king had erected his standard on Mount Zion and made Jerusalem his headquarters. In the war of which these two camps were the symbols, and the issues of which were to be grand beyond all former precedent, Loyola has chosen, he believed, to be one of the chief captains. He longed to place himself at the center of action. The way thither was long. Wide oceans and gloomy deserts had to be traversed, and hostile tribes passed through. But he had an iron will, a boundless enthusiasm, and, what was more, a divine call, for such it seemed to him in his delusion. Yeah, his divine call was a call from Satan, and he had an iron will, that's because he was working for the, for the beast that has, in the figure of Daniel, iron legs and feet. Loyola prepared a book of spiritual exercises as a guide to his followers. It is a set of rules which teaches men to conduct the work of their own conversion. Huh? It is, set of, it is a set of rules which teaches men how to conduct the work of their own conversion. Means, I can save myself. The methods prescribed are an android imitation of that process of conviction, of alarm, of enlightenment and of peace through which the Holy Spirit leads the soul which actually experiences that blessed and wonderful change. Loyola, like the magicians of old who strove to rival Moses, wrought with his Jesuit enchantment to produce the same miracles the gospel was at that very time producing in the hearts of millions throughout Christendom.
The Book of Secret Instructions, generally attributed to Linus, the second father general or uh, yeah, general of the society, contains directions so unprincipled that on the first page it is ordained that if a copy of this book should ever fall into the hands of strangers, it was to be positively denied that these were the rules of the society. And we spoke about this subject abundantly during our reading of Code Word Babylon, which you may remember is still published on our YouTube channels, speaking Brett's and mine. Brett, maybe you have a little comment on what I just read here on the secret instructions <laughs> of the Jesuits? You know, Yerk, I don't know what it is about us here, but we're getting to know each other really extraordinarily well. I just looked up <laughs> the um, the term adroit, I believe it's pronounced adroit, uh, the bottom of the last page, the methods prescribed are an adroit imitation of that process. So I wanted to look up adroit and I just found it. And the definition, which I've never heard before, is dexterous, skillful, active in the use of the hands and in the exercise of the mental faculties ingenious, ready in invention or execution. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I thought of Android when you said it, but I thought, no, 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 no. Android. Android, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what, what is that? You know, I've never even heard this word before. That's what's so fascinating about doing this study, Yerk. I just love it. Because mm. oh, I love to look up old words and find out what their definitions are. Because in, in my view, that's what's been lost here. We've lost a lot. A great deal. And many people even reject the old words, by that they mm -hmm. reject the quote-unquote old King James Bible, they rather mm. prefer the new King James Bible or any other new version because th this is not full of archaic words, as they say. Don't They don't understand that they lose a lot of the original meaning of it, and that's the same with reading these old books that can give you a completely different light on history. Yeah. Please continue, Jörg. Thank you. Okay. In 1622 AD, an ancient of war dragged a copy of these secret instructions into the light of day. And we read about that, as I said earlier, in our reading of Code World Babylon. It is in one of the very first, uh, it is in the very first readings of that book anyway, so you just have to look mm -hmm. within the first five or six um, broadcasts we did on reading that wonderful book by P.D. Stewart to get to that subject. The Duke of Brunswick, in the course of the Thirty Years' War in Germany that was running between 1618 and 1648, so that 1622 was right in the middle of that war, plundered the Jesuit college at Paderborn in Westphalia. In the library was found a copy of this devilish book. Another copy was discovered when the Jesuit college at Prague was plundered. Soon after, these books were reprinted and translated in Germany, Holland, France and England. Of course, the authenticity of the work was denied by the Jesuits, as was to be expected. Any society which would compile such a book would have no scruples in denying it. Grezza, a well-known Jesuit, affirmed that the Secreta Monita, i.e. the secret instructions, was a forgery by a member of the society who had been dismissed with ignominy from the society in Poland, and that he published it in 1616 AD. Father Gerard, an English Jesuit, in a pamphlet published by the Roman Catholic Truth Society, says they were first published in 1614. These dates, however, are only Jesuit afterthoughts and, like their histories, utterly unreliable. The reader who cannot credit the statement that such a devilish book is circulated among the Jesuits is strongly recommended to consult the official catalogue of Jesuit writings in the British Museum Library. There the student will find hundreds of books long out of print, some dating back nearly 400 years. 
There are several copies of the secret instructions, i.e. the secret uh, Secreta Monita, copies from state papers, parliamentary reports, and authentic records from almost all the countries in the world in which the Jesuits have carried on the devilish operations under the cloak of Christianity. After a few days amongst these old books, the reader will have no difficulty in deciding for himself whether or not the Secreta Monita is the Bible of the Jesuits, the book which regulates their daily lives. This catalogue is in the library of the British Museum, and then he gives a number where you can find that. The Secreta Monita was published also in 1850 in London. And uh, there we go into another footnote that we will see later. In Cold Word Babylon, we speak about a uh, Jesuit priest who left the book behind under the mattress of his room that he rented mm -hmm. in South America. And uh, in the meantime, when he was away, that book was found by the next renter of the room and he took that book away. And of course, we know that it was published during the 18th century also in France, like not only the secret instructions, but also like the constitutions of the Jesuits that have been published in 1762, if I'm not mistaken, in France, because of the case of Lavalette. Yeah. And when you want to know about this, which book you are going to, well, the one from Griesinger we spoke in the beginning, because he has all of that written in his wonderful book. Yeah. So let's go back to the text here. Father Gerard, an English Jesuit, in a pamphlet published by the Roman Catholic Truth Society, says they were first published in 1614. These dates, however, are only Jesuit afterthoughts and, like their histories, utterly unreliable. Gretzau was convicted of the grossest falsehood by Dr. James, a former keeper of the Bodleian Library in Oxford. His testimony, therefore, is worthless. And I want to make just one little comment on the secret instructions or even the constitutions of the Jesuits. So the Secreta Monita or the Constitutionis de la Compagnie de Jesus. The point that I want to make is the following. You will always, 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 when you put out this quote-unquote knowledge into the world, be attacked especially by lovers of Roman Catholicism and even more by followers and lovers of the, uh, of the Jesuit order themselves. And they will always say, no, 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 that's all not true. We are such a wonderful society. We are just there to educate people and to give new lives and we do charity and this and that and blah, blah, blah. Jesus said, by their fruits you will know them. You will know the tree by the fruits it grows. So without even reading the Secreta Moneta, or without even reading the um, uh, constitutions of the Jesuit order, just look at what they did, what is documented throughout the last almost five centuries, I mean four centuries for the moment, yeah, uh, almost five centuries now, what they did. It is documented, and books like Riesinger put it all documented into writ, and you can, you can read it, and you can study it for yourself. Hey, and if you really want to go all the way, what keeps you from visiting libraries, going to universities, libraries, going to um, uh, li libraries and, 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 uh, of, um, of the government even, yeah? going into document centers of your government in the United States or in what country ever you are living in, and or, or even go to the archives of the Roman Catholic Church. What hinders you to do that if you say what I, Jogler, say here on this video is not true, what Griesinger says in his book is not true, what Albert Close says here in his book is not true? What hinders you to do your own studies diligently as the writers of these books did? Well, if you can't come up with an answer, then don't, then, then don't deny what we say here is truth, because we have proof after proof after proof, and we have history and the deeds of history that took place in the past, that everything is true to the point, and probably even worse 
then written down in the secret instructions, the Secreta Munita, or the constitutions of the Jesuits. Any comment from one of you guys? Ah, yeah, the Jesuits. <laughs> I love that pronunciation. Yeah, chapter 10 of Rules of Evil speaks about the Jesuits, you know? Great. Um, let's see. It's a few pages from here. I was just studying this because Oh, tonight, you were? <laughs> uh, yeah, because tonight I'm going to read this. It's in ah. chapter 10 definitions. It comes wow. up with um, numbers, chapter, what is it? Uh, numbers, chapter 26, verse 44. Of the children of Asher, after their families. Of Jimna, the family of the Jimnites. Of Jezuai, the family of the Jesuits. Of Beriah, the family oh of Berenites. Yeah? So the Whoa. Jesuits are even in the Bible. <laughs> wow. At least in the English one, not in the German one. Yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah. So what you see here, that is a little peek that you get on the German version of uh, Rulers of Evil, the complete book translated, the part that I'm going to read tonight. But back. Oh to yes, I vaguely remember that now from way back in 2015 when you were reading it, Yerk. Yeah, it's yep, been I some do, years. Vaguely. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, a lot to remember, isn't there? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Uh. It's a it headache is. sometimes. History is just wonderful, especially when you hear and there remember something that you read some years ago. Mm, there's so much. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, I think it is very important that we understand what I just made in the comment here, that uh, by the fruits you will know them. Mm -hmm. So whether you deny everything that is written here is true or not, do your own research and measure everything to the deeds they have done in the past, all the assassinations, all the infiltrations, all the subversions, all the revolutions. And of course, that also uh, takes into account the American Revolution, right, that we have here, Rulers of Evil. Yeah? Uh, I, I even have the English book here. This is... Um, uh, Rulers of Evil from F. Tapasorsi, and here you have it in the English version, the same picture in the chapter 10 of Definitions. Yeah. Um, all these books wonderfully expose uh, the Jesuit order to the fullest. So we are going into a next part here of uh, the book from Albert Close. We leave the personal um, development of uh, Ignatius of Loyola, and we come to the synopsis of the secret instructions of the, secret, uh, of the Society of Jesus, or the Jesuits. And it's interesting, of course, because we read a lot of this already during Cold World Babylon. So to Brett and me, I think there's barely something new in this, but Michael has not um, uh, accompanied us in the beginning of the book reading, so he probably will learn here and there a little bit some new today which, of course, is the same as you guys who watch this video who have maybe, maybe never even heard of this. It deals in Chapter 1 with the secret instructions how to plant their first establishments, to visit the hospitals, yeah, to do in quote-unquote charity, to find out the wealth of their several districts, to make purchases in another name, to draw the youth around them. You know, give me the youth and I'm going to give you a man that you will not recognize uh, in the way, in the spirit of what Adolf Hitler said. How to get the friendship of great men. Well, that's important because the Jesuits never start from the button. They always start from the top. How to manage princes. Exactly in the same way. They start from the top. And they are being made, first and for all, confessors to the ruling class. How to direct their policy, meaning the policy of the princes and kings, conduct their embassies, taught to effect a great show of lowliness. Shrewd, practical and precise are the secret instructions of the Jesuits. That is very well versed and put together. First of all, they are told to select the best points in the great field of Christendom, which they are in due time to subjugate and possess. They are to begin by establishing convents or colleges in the chief cities, 
The great centers of population and wealth secured, the smaller places will be easily occupied later. Should anyone ask on their first arrival in a country on what errand the good fathers have come, they are instructed to reply that their quote, sole object is the salvation of souls, unquote. They are to be careful to maintain a humble and submissive deportment. They are to pay frequent visits to the hospitals, the sick chamber and the prisons. Remember Pope Francis a few years ago washing the feet of prisoners? They are to make great show of charity. <laughs> they are to make great show of charity. Brothers, what did Jesus Christ say? concerning charity wasn't that in Matthew chapter 6 if I'm not mistaken let me just see where's this um, uh, I have to go to the oh man <laughs> I think it could be Matthew 6 18 that yeah, thou I, th I thought not it was unto Matthew man 6. to fast, but unto mm -hmm. thy father which is in secret, and thy father which sees in secret shall reward thee openly. Yeah. Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Um, it is about praying in the open. It is about uh, charity out in the open. So, um, this is a little bit earlier, I think, here. Um, isn't it? Or is it a little bit later? Because this is our Father, and then after the Our Father, must be here somewhere. Um, or is it in Matthew 23, when he speaks to the Pharisees about, mm -hmm, you know, sure. um, yep. the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Yeah. Yep, that's Matthew The scribes 23. and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. And so on and so on. Oh, yeah. And here it is. But all their works they do f for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms and feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men. Rabbi, Rabbi! But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man upon fa uh, 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 your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Um, this is still not the place that I was looking for, but I think it is somewhere here in, uh, in chapter 23. Yeah, you know, so that when you are doing charity and all that stuff, do that in the hidden room. Isn't that in, in, in Matthew 6? No, six? no, it's not here. No. It's Matthew About 6, charity. right? Yeah, probably. Yep. Yeah. Sounds right. Um, the problem is sometimes that you are looking for something and then um, you cannot find the right place because we are not that well versed in the Bible that we can tell with every word where that is in um, that we. Uh, do not know the exact book or verse here uh, charity it even speaks about only in Corinthians not even somewhere in Matthew so mm. uh, oh it's alms your alms A-L-M-S yeah I, I know think. how to write that thank you alms yeah I think this yes. is it Matthew 6 1 yeah it's in the beginning there take heed that you do not your arms before men to be seen of them otherwise you have no reward of your father which is in heaven therefore when thou doest thine arms do not sound the trumpet before thee as the hypocrites or the Jesuits do in the synagogues and in the streets and they may have glory of men verily I say unto you they have their reward but when thou doest arms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that mine arms may be in secret, 
and thy father which sees in secret himself shall reward thee openly. These are the verses. Sorry, thank you. Uh, thank You're you. You're welcome. I was, I was looking for, and this is exactly what this goes against here. They are to make great show of charity. Exactly the opposite of what Jesus Christ taught when we just read. These good deeds, and good deeds, of course, you must put into quotation marks, will not lose their reward if only they take care not to do them in secret. Men will begin to speak of them and say, What a humble, pious, charitable order of men these fathers of the society of Jesus are! All the Jesuits are carefully to note the rich men in their community. They must find out who owns the estates in the neighborhood and what are their yearly revenues. They are to secure these estates by gift, if possible, if not, by purchase. When it happens that they, quote, get anything that is considerable, let the purchase be made under a strange name by some of our lay friends, that our poverty may still seem the greater, and let our provincial, quote, assign such revenues to some other colleges, more remote, that neither prince nor people may ever discover anything of our profits, unquote. Wherever the Jesuits came, they opened schools and colleges and gathered the youth of the land around them. But despite their zeal in the work of education, knowledge somehow did not increase. The intellect refused to expand and the genius to open under their teaching. About all the youth learned was the Catechism. The Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church that is 180 degrees contrary to the teaching of the Gospel in the Bible. Jesuit Secret Instructions, Chapter 2. I start reading when my brothers don't have any questions or remarks on what I just read. Thanks, Jörg. It's, uh, it's been a um, really good lesson also uh, to note that, um, isn't it Rome? Uh, when you look up an old older definitions of Rome, you find that they are the high places. They are the high places. I remember when I was younger, you know, I was thinking, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a house on a hill? <laughs> yeah, Rome is the city on seven hills, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, Saturn of old, huh? When you get a little older, you find out why it's not so, such a good thing. You know, if you're paying attention to the Bible, if you're reading your Bible, you find out, you know, these kind of things are not so good. They're not something we should really desire, are they now, after all? That's right. Probably not. Yep, high places are dangerous places. It's where the lightning strikes. Yeah, it's because if you're going to high places, uh, you are going to exalt yourself instead of giving all honor to God. Huh? That's right. That's right. Yep, like the high church as opposed to the quote-unquote low church. Or the high mass compared to the low mass mm. in mm -hmm. Roman Catholicism. Because I don't know high, anything about that. Yeah, because for the high mass, you have to pay much more. Mm. You know? I see. Michael, I get any it. comments? Uh, later. Okay, <laughs> later. Then I'm going to continue reading in part two here. Jesuit Secret Instructions, chapter two. The second chapter of the instructions is entitled, What Must Be Done to Get the Ear and the Intimacy of Great Men? To stand well with monarchs and princes is, of course, a matter of such importance that no stone is to be left unturned to attain it. They are to surround them with confessors chosen from the society, from the Jesuit society. But by no means are they to bear hard on the consciences of their royal penitents. They are to study their humors. humors. Should they be inclined to marry with their own kindred, they are to smooth their way by hinting at a dispensation from the Pope or by finding some palliative for the sin. 
they may tell them that such marriages, though forbidden to the commonality, are sometimes allowed to princes. For the greater glory of God, ad maiorem dei gloria, the motto of the Jesuits. If a monarch is bent to, on some enterprise, a war for example, the issue of which is doubtful, they are to be at pains so to sharp their counsel in the matter that if the affair succeeds, they shall have all the praise, and if it proves disastrous, the blame shall rest with the king alone. Be sure, say the secret instructions, to paint the men whom the prince dislikes in the same colors in which his jealousy and hatred teach him to view them. If the prince is unmarried, it will be a fine stroke of policy to choose a wife for him from among the beautiful and noble ladies known to the Jesuit society. This is seen by experience in the House of Austria and in the kingdoms of Poland and France and in many other principalities. In a little footnote we read here, the Jesuits are blamed in France for something the First Franco-Prussian War. They are accused of employing the Empress Eugenie as their tool. When war was declared, she is said to have exclaimed to members of her suite, This is my war! 400 Jesuits left Hastings for the continent in August 3rd, 1914, two days before we in England knew there was to be war. This is from the Daily Mail, August 4th, 1914. The Vatican and Germany knew it, however, and the Jesuits received some hint or other in advance. The Dresdner Bank advised its clients to sell their English shares and stocks 17 days before the war broke out. Sir Edward Holden. Jesuits and German statesmen knew war was inevitable. All were in the plot to crush Britain. Interesting, huh? What kind of hmm. sight you all of a sudden get from the outbreak of World War One, when you take into consideration religion, which of course is never taught about when you just talk about the assassination of the Prince of Austria in Sarajevo in 1914, which is taught everyone. That was the reason for the world, First World War to break out, yeah? We must endeavor to breed dissension among great men and raise seditions or anything a prince would have, have us to do to please him. If one who is chief minister of state to a monarch who is our friend oppose us, and that prince cast his whole favors upon him, so as to add titles to his honor, we must present ourselves before him and court him in the highest degree as well by visits as all humble respect." Unquote. And the little footnote I probably read already, didn't I? Where's number two here? I see. Number yeah, two. I'm trying to see it too, Yerk. Ah, I yeah, don't yeah, see okay. it. Okay, here's number two. Yeah, here's number. Oh two. yeah. Okay, number right. This is what I just. Read. I, I I I actually read uh, another. Uh, I, I read the what, asterisk. What's coming, yeah, the, uh, the asterisk. What's, what's coming here? So, um, this is after what we just read here. Okay. Oh. Anyway, if say the secret instructions, if these lords be seculars. We ought to have recourse to their aid and friendship against our adversaries, and to their favor in our own suits, and those of our friends, and to their authority and power in the purchase of houses, manors, and gardens, and stones to build with, especially in those, pal uh, in those places that will not endure to hear uh, of our settling in them, because the authority of these lords s uh, serveth very much for the appeasing of the populace and making our ill willers quiet. Let ours that are in the services of princes keep but a very little money and a few movables contenting themselves with a little chamber, modestly keeping company with persons in humble station and so being in good esteem they ought prudently to persuade princes to do nothing without their counsel, whether it be in spiritual or in temporal affairs. The sixth chapter of the instructions treats of the means to acquire the friendship of rich widows. <laughs> and again, Griesinger goes uh, very, very deep into that subject in his book. Yes, yeah, just like seducing the weaker uh, sex, isn't it? And misusing the weaker sex in all ways possible. 
for mm -hmm. money, for sex, and everything else. Yeah. First, a father of suitable gifts, the author continues to say, is to be selected to begin operations. He must not, in point of years, exceed middle age. He must have a fresh complexion and a gracious discourse. He is to visit the widow, to touch feelingly on her position and the snars and injuries to which it exposes her, and to hint at the fraternal care that the society of which he is a member delights to exercise over all in her position who choose to place themselves under its guardianship. After a few visits of this sort, the widow will probably appear at one of the chapels of the society. Should it so happen, the next step is to appoint a confessor of their body for her. Of their body, meaning the Jesuit body. The instructions direct that it may be advisable to have an oratory erected in her house, with an altar and frequent mass and confession celebrated thereat. The great duty of arms, that queen of the graces, quote, without which is to be represented to her, she cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven, which arms she ought not to dispose to everyone, if it be not, uh, if it be not by the device and with the consent of her spiritual father, unquote. The one great point to be made at, uh, at is Sorry, the one great point to be made at is to get her to make the, an entire surrender of her estate to the Jesuit society. Rich widows are to be exhorted, quote, to contribute to the finishing of our colleges, which are yet imperfect for the greater glory of God, at maiorem dei gloriam, giving us lambs and pixels, and for the building other foundations of houses, which we, the poor servants of the Society of Jesus, do still want, that all things may be perfected. Unquote. In the ninth chapter, that ninth chapter is entitled, quote, Of the means to augment the revenues of our colleges. Quote, our provincial ought to send expert men into all those places where there is any considerable number of rich and wealthy persons to the end they may give their superiors a true and faithful account. Oh, comment. Yeah, please. Yeah, Jörg, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, augment the revenues of the colleagues? Is that, or is that colleges? I guess it's colleges. I thought it was colleagues. I'm sorry. My my fault. <laughs> my bad. It's colleges. Where is that here? I don't see that. Um, the, the top of oh, that. Oh, the revenues uh, of our colleges. Yeah, here. Yeah, colleges. sorry. Yeah, not colleges. I, I got that wrong. Oh, okay, that can happen. That can happen. Anyway, we are on the start of another page. Let's just take a little break because we have almost come to an hour and I know that Michael has some remarks he wants to um, end the broadcast with today uh, because I have commented a lot during the reading and Brett has commented a lot during the reading. So let's get Michael the closing words of this broadcast um, and then Brett, of course. So I'm done with the reading for today. I can only uh, renew my call for everyone to get that book from Griesinger and have a read at it, have a look at it. It's a wonderful read and you will be astonished of what you hadn't, of what you didn't know about the Jesuits yet and which is so important knowledge to understand the world that we live in today. Because we are reading here the divine program of the world's history and if you do not know the real world's history which has mainly the four, last four or five hundred years written by the Jesuit order, then you cannot make any understanding of the present time, nor can you make any predictions for the future. And that's what I want to end my broadcast with today. So I leave the closing remarks to Michael and, of course, then to our host, Brett Norman. Please, brothers. Yeah, thank you, Jörg. And thank you for the reading and thank you for the interesting thought on every subject. I just don't know where to start. Um, I just uh, typed and typed and typed uh, some comments and I'm quite not finished yet. Um, first of all, I was struggling when you were citing the theme of the Jesuits, which is ad maiorium de gloriam, for the greater glory of God. And it 
just suddenly uh, popped into my mind <clears throat> that for the greater glory of God um, is something similar to the uh, Islamic motto, which is uh, Alwa Akbar, which also means that God is greater or the greatest, it's greater. So their God is greater than anything, and it's just as similar, for, for, especially for me, it's, it's similar that uh, it's for the greater glory. So there is, uh, yeah, there's some, something, um, something quite similar to me, um, which is uh, for the Jesuits, uh, is they are exalting themselves, they are positioning themselves above the regular followers of uh, the Roman Catholic Church, for example. But it's not the main point I'm focused on. I just read on the page, let me tell you, on the page um, 87, um, it was cited that there is, um, uh, where is it? It's some, somewhere it's cited that there is a, a Roman Catholic Truth Society. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which... Uh, which seemed to be some kind of joke, um, because it's just a well-known fact, especially for the listeners of this program, that the Roman Catholic Church does not rely on any truth, um, especially not on biblical truth. But ah, it's at the bottom of the page in the book. At the top of the page, you read 57, right? Uh, yeah, it's at correct. The bottom it's of correct. the page. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. By the Roman Catholic truth... Society it says they were fir first published in 1614. So it's just uh, that I just uh, was uh, quite uh, uh, amused by listening, by, by learning that there is a truth society, even in the Roman Catholic society. Um, I was also um, beginning to evaluate the fact that there is also this uh, so called secret monita or secreta monita where secreta is just uh, the plural of uh, secret. And as we know from uh, reading and citing the King James Bible, um, that there is no secret which cannot be revealed by the Almighty God of the, of the, of the real Bible. And so secrets are also uh, things which are made by men and a secret society cannot be um, of, 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 of any divine origination because the secret is sec uh, which, because God does not do anything in secret. He does it on the, on the plain open, in the plain open. And so it's just that the man, that man cannot hide something before the Almighty God. That's, that's, one, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, it's just interesting that there are so many secret societies. And in my opinion, you may share your views on that, Brett. Uh, I know that you're maybe some scratching your fingernails on, on the table right yet. But uh, <laughs> I, in, in, in the meantime, I was very busy looking into the English Webster Dictionary. Because I find it very interesting that there is uh, something, uh, uh, quite a similarity... If you look at uh, secrets, and in the Webster dictionary, I found that just I'm beginning to think. Okay, um, I just found that uh, the Webster's dictionary. It's a Merriam-Webster.com page. I found mm -hmm. it that uh, the definition of secret is uh, kept from knowledge of you, hidden. And uh, I like to to hand it over now uh, to share my screen. So that you guys and uh, all in the open can uh, now uh, see it. Is, is it is it uh, now displayed on your? Yes, computer? it is. Right? Thank you, okay. Michael. So so it's it's a secret is an adjective. It's the definition of secret is to keep something hidden, which is of course against the Bible, and it's working as undercover secret agent and uh, and so forth and so forth and so forth or revealed only to the initiated which is the esoteric meaning of it or the occult hidden meaning of it okay so if you look for the origin in the Lat in the latin language it's secretum and i just uh, googled that also 
I hope it will show up soon. Yeah, okay. It's secretum. It's a private seal. It's a de definition of secretum. And uh, I was just just uh, putting that up, especially on, on our German forum, for example, this afternoon or this evening. But uh, I just found it only in, in, English, in, uh, in, in German language. And I found it very interesting that there is a, is a secretum or a secret is kind of art or kind of similar to the poison which the snake is using. Huh. So, yeah. yeah. So, it, it's, it's also a sec secret. Yeah? It's a secret. And so, I think that's, uh, that's, that's quite interesting, which, uh, which, which, is, uh, which is going into going in my mind for, for several days now to look it over if there are some similarities. And I, then I used uh, Esort on the verse on the adjective secret and it appears that there are so many secrets around the word secret um, that there are so many uh, different meanings when in the New Testament <coughs> secret is mostly used as the Greek word kryptos or kryptos and in the Old Testament it has just another origin or just another meaning maybe it's just a secret it's setha or sitra which uh, might be some uh, Sather, Sitra, which may also be some kind of similarity to Satan. I don't know, because it just, uh, it just got into my mind, you see, and I have not enough time to study it very much in deep. But I found it a very interesting topic that the secret uh, which, has, which shall not be revealed to us by our, our opponents, especially from the Jesuits, uh, might be some uh, secret or secret, which the snake is using um, from their so-called knowledge, which is, of course, Gnostic, which is uh, transferred to the Jesuit and to every secret society. And that I would like to share, and that I would that's, I would like to share to you, both guys and to many men out there in the open. But uh, pardon me for not getting very much deep into the subject because it uh, requires a lot of work and a lot of time, and it, I, I couldn't make it uh, within this this lecture. Okay, and it's so about giving people ideas what they can do on their own research, Michael. That's very well done. Right, mm -hmm. very well mm -hmm. done. Yeah. Yes, agreed. Certainly, uh, this uh, so-called culture we live in today in the United States and around the world uh, it's going the way of globalism so called and what they're doing is they're mixing up all of the different uh, customs and uh, different traditions and it's become a hodgepodge and you know and now with the internet uh, with social networking you can comment on everything and anything on any topic you wish at any time you wish and it's very obnoxious and I think the older we get the less patience we have for this type of behavior and um, well everything comes with its price I guess but very interesting you bring up the fact, Michael, about secreta uh, and the secrets and secretions of the serpent. Um, yeah, just, just a secret is just a poison uh, yeah, of the snake to kill, right. to kill the enemies, you see. Yeah, that's <clears throat> right. Yeah. And that's exactly how Satan works through his little network of fellows, the Roman Catholic Truth Society. Of course, they had to come up with a Roman Catholic Truth Society because there's a Protestant Truth Society. You know, and that's what this book is coming from. This is Albert Close in Great Britain dealing with World War I. And, you know, we're not going to really know in full detail Perhaps till we get to uh, either stand in the judgment or, you know, maybe in heaven, you know. But on this earth, we're going to suffer. We are going to be in, a, exposed to the turmoil 
of lost souls that are just completely losing it when we mention to them why we have our faith, why we believe in Jesus Christ the way we do, and that no one can shake us from it because we've done our studies, we've done our researches. Doesn't mean we're done yet. Doesn't mean they're done yet. It means that we are working on refining our faith. We're asking others to do the same, and they don't like it. But that's the way it works on the Brett Norman YouTube channel. And I want to thank Yerk Glissman and Michael for joining me today. And I'm really looking forward to continuing next time. We'll see you then. God bless. Bye-bye. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep, that your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren, he that speaketh evil of his brother, and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy, and sell, and get gain. For as ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire.